Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Welcome to Contemporary Science Issues. Today our guest is David Stipp, and he is the author of The Youth Pill. David Stipp has written about science, medicine, the environment, and biotech since 1982 for the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Salon, Science, and other publications. He's led Fortune's science and medical coverage from 1995 to 2005 as a senior writer, and he's covered science and medicine as a staff reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He's won a National Association of Science Writers Award for Best Magazine article, and he served as a Knight Fellow in Journalism at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Over the past decade, he's written extensively about the study of aging, including his recently launched book, The Youth Pill, Scientists on the Brink of an Anti-Aging Revolution. Welcome, David Stipp. Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by asking if you could give us a little background about how this science developed. Well, uh, I think uh, first I wanted to just mention uh, one thing I'm not going to talk about, and that is uh, immortality. I think uh, many people, when they hear the term anti-aging research, immediately assume that the subject is going to be the pursuit of eternal life. Uh, the media has paid a lot of attention to that subject in recent years, but it's not what scientists are actually pursuing in the lab. What they're pursuing instead are ways to slow the rate of aging so that you could postpone the onset of all diseases of aging enough to increase the period of healthy life. So about five years ago, some leading gerontologists, including the late Robert Butler, the founding director of the National Institute on Aging, uh, got together and publicly stated that it now seems realistically achievable to find interventions that could postpone the onset of all diseases of aging by about seven years. Um, that may not sound like very much, compar especially compared to what we hear about with regard to ideas for radical life extension, but it would actually be a very important advance. In fact, I think it would be potentially the most important medical advance that I've seen in three decades as a medical writer. So I, I think the natural question immediately arises, why now, given that this, a this whole area has been constantly fraught with snake oil over the years, why is there now, are there now grounds for reasonable optimism uh, that we could develop anti-aging interventions? And I think the reasons are a number of surprising developments that have happened in gerontology, the study of aging over the past 20 years. And in particular, a very surprising development, which is the discovery of single gene mutations that could dramatically extend lifespan in animals. So this showed first that aging is far more plastic, the rate of aging is far more malleable than we thought, and also that, it, that interventions that aren't all that complicated might be able to slow it down. So last year, an even more exciting development happened. For the first time, scientists reported that they had convincingly extended lifespan in mammals with a drug. Uh, this, this development concerned a drug called rapamycin, which uh, is now on the market, actually. It's used to treat uh, rejection of transplanted organs. And uh, this development was doubly exciting because the scientists gave this drug to the mice late in their lives. They were already 20 months old, which for a mouse is about the equivalent of the human age of 60. And at that age, it wasn't thought that anything could really uh, slow down aging or have much effect on aging. But surprisingly, it did. It had quite a dramatic effect. In fact, it increased, this drug increased the life expectancy of these nearly elderly mice by about a third. The, the amount of uh, percentage gain in life expectancy from birth was smaller than that. It was more like 11 or 12 percent. So I just wanted to briefly touch on what that might mean if we could replicate 
that in people. Uh, it, at first glance, it doesn't sound like all that much. But if we applied, say, 11% gain to our current approximately 80-year life expectancy at birth, we would get about nine additional years of life. And these would probably be healthy years because everything we know about the way this drug works in the mice and everything we know about other anti-aging interventions, such as these gene mutations that I mentioned a minute ago, uh, tend to confer a period of healthy life without extending or prolonging misery toward the end of life. So if we got nine extra years um, in life expectancy, uh, that would be a significant gain. It doesn't sound like much, especially in light of the fact that during the 20th century, we actually gained 30 years in life expectancy. But how did we do that? We have to look at how we managed to, to pull off this amazing feat of, of adding that many years of life expectancy in this country. We went from life expectancy of about 47 all the way up to 77. We did that mainly by decreasing mortality early in life, by removing uh, infectious disease deaths early in life from childhood mortality and other, and, and a little bit later in life, by simple measures such as increased sanitation, the, the use of vaccines, and a little bit later in the century, antibiotics. Then later in the century, we made some further significant gains by reducing mortality later in life, particularly pushing off fatal heart attacks that often happen in midlife by lifestyle changes, less smoking, high blood pressure drugs, other things like that. So we made some really significant gains, mainly by tackling fairly tractable diseases. Uh, now we're up against a much harder problem. We're having to attack very, uh, in, very difficult to treat diseases, progressive diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, congestive heart failure. It's very hard uh, uh, to, to defeat these diseases, and it's especially difficult because we now have to, to increase life expectancy very much. We now have to push against all of them at once at a time in life when their risk is already quite high and it's also rising exponentially. So I think the, the current costs, the exploding costs of geriatric medicine give us a pretty good idea of how difficult this is. And to, to give a, an even better idea of how difficult it is, demographers of aging have looked at, at the kind of life expectancy gain we could get if we totally wiped out, for instance, coronary heart disease. That would buy us only about three extra years in lo of life expectancy. If we similarly completely wiped out cancer, that would also buy us about three extra years of life expectancy. And the reason these gains are so surprisingly small is that after age 65 or so, so many things are competing to kill us that even if we completely wiped out one of them, something else would step up to the plate and soon knock us out of the park. So um, I think if we then look at that nine-year life expectancy that we might get if we could replicate the effects of rapamycin had in mice and replicate that in people, we would have the equivalent of winning, totally winning the war on cancer three times over. In addition, in addition to that, we would have gains, unprecedented gains, the equivalent of them against coronary heart disease and other diseases of aging. So this would actually be really quite significant. And, and the, it gets me to the crux of why I'm so excited about this research. It's not about radical life extension. It's about a new kind of preventive medicine that would push back against every single thing that goes wrong as we get older. Not just fatal diseases, but also things like cataracts, loss of hearing acuity, sexual dysfunction, even cosmetic things like wrinkles. And this would probably bias healthy years by pushing against all these diseases at once. So um, I think it's interesting to look at, at the possible effects on just a single disease that, that often comes to mind when people talk about aging, and that's Alzheimer's. Right now, an estimated four to five million Americans are, are afflicted with this terrible disease. It's estimated to cost our nation about $100 billion a year in health care and lost econo and other economic costs. Uh, by mid-century, the way things are going, it's projected that as many as 16 million Americans would have this disease and it would cost us as much as a trillion dollars a year. These are huge numbers. So let's, let's switch briefly and look at a contrasting picture 
in Okinawa, a prefecture of Japan. Okinawa happens to have the world's highest concentration per capita of centenarians, more people over 100 uh, per capita than any other part of the country. And I think a major reason for that, perhaps the main reason, is that the traditional Okinawan diet is very low in calories. And it, in fact, is, seems to be a form of what's called mild calorie restriction. Calorie restriction is a phenomenon discovered in the 1930s to slow aging in rodents. It's a very low calorie diet, it's near starvation diet, but it was found to reliably slow down aging and extend healthy life in rodents and other species. It appears that something like that is going on with these people in Okinawa. And here's the data point that I find most interesting about them. A long-term study of centenarians and other elderly people in Okinawa has shown that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease between ages of 85 and 90 is half that of, of Americans of similar age. I think that is one of the most exciting and important statistics in the, in the entire literature on aging. And I think anybody who, whose family has been touched by dementia would have to agree. Okay. Right, I, that's, that's wonderful. Can you give us a, an idea of how this science developed? You gave wonderful examples in your book of some of the old sort of magic ideas and their, their amusing in a lot of respects. And now we're on a much more serious track um, which we'll also ask you about how they pursue that, but uh, if you could uh, describe some of that history of the development of the, uh, the science of aging. Sure, things. sure. Well, um, I, I think the history of, of aging uh, could probably be divided into three eras. And, and, the, and the first one is, is kind of like the dark ages, and, and this is a period when uh, sort of the characteristic strategy is to, is to single out something that's going downhill with age and then just presume that that is the, the, the main cause of aging and also assume that you can find some way to restore what's lost and thereby rejuvenate elderly people. And, and this idea has been around a long time and it's still around, it's still uh, very much at play in the, in the anti-aging realm. Uh, and during the Middle Ages, the real Dark Ages, I guess, uh, it gave rise to things like, like um, elderly men inhaling the breath of young virgins in hopes of, of restoring some lost essence of, of youthful vitality and stuff. Uh, and when the era of modern science came along, this, this idea was still very much alive. And early endocrinologists soon noticed that levels of a number of hormones in the blood tend to diminish with age. And they particularly fixated on male sex hormones. And, and this gave rise to uh, something I've, I've, I've written about in the book that, that I call the great gland madness of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And what happened was a, a booming business developed in the transplantation or implantation of animal testicles in elderly men in hopes of rejuvenating them. In fact, one of the leading practitioners of this idea, a, do a doctor named Serge Voronov in Paris, uh, found that there was so much demand for his uh, surgeries that he had to set up a monkey farm in Italy to provide raw materials uh, to, to meet the demand. Uh, even more notorious was uh, a another uh, practitioner of the, of the gland madness era, uh, a guy named John Brinkley in Kansas, who was an evangelist and kind of self-anointed doctor. And he developed a kind of low-budget way to, to do this in which he implanted goat testicles. And it's re been reported that, that he actually uh, implanted goat testicles in some 16,000 elderly men that flocked to his, quote, medico gospel <laughs> goat farm. Uh, I sort of doubt that the outcomes were all that good, especially because the record shows that Dr. Brinkley was often inebriated while he was performing his surgeries. So this idea is still around. You can find this basic strategy of trying to restore something that's presumed to be the cause of aging in, in anti-aging clinics in places like Southern California, which, which uh, promise to inject human growth hormone or testosterone or other hormones and restore lost vigor. Um, but I, I think uh, what the next period in the whole history here that's important was what I think of as, 
is kind of the the uh, the period of, of righteous despair, and that that began in the 1950s when uh, evolutionary thinkers finally figured out an answer to the why question on aging. That is, why do we get old? And in a nutshell, it's basically that the blind watchmaker of evolution, as biologist Richard Dawkins so wittily put it, uh, loses interest in us after we reach reproductive maturity. And you can see that this idea would make a great deal of sense because, after all, natural selection and evolution is all about improving a reproductive fitness. So basically what happens is that after reproductive maturity, genes that evolution has installed in us and of course in other animals to kind of preserve youthful vigor and vibrancy long enough for us to fling our genomes into the future, they lose their beneficial force. And as a result, we basically get trashed by random damage. Uh, things like free radical damage to DNA and other molecular damage. Uh, cause, probably causes most of the deterioration of aging. So one of the implications of this idea is that a lot of things go wrong simultaneously as we get old. Mm -hmm. That is, genes are going downhill, a lot of metabolic pathways are deteriorating, so we have this situation where it seemed to these evolutionary thinkers that anyone trying to develop an anti-aging intervention would be in the, the position of, of the little Dutch boy, so to speak, rushing up to stick his finger in the dike and then looking around him and noticing that there are thousands of leaks springing out all around him and that he's suddenly become, unfortunately, the protagonist of a tragedy. Uh, and one of the, the leading evolutionary biologists who, who developed this kind of compelling logic of despair, George Williams, uh, compared the quest for anti-aging interventions to the pursuit of perpetual motion. In other words, it's little more than just junk, hopeless science. So th this period lasted about 30 years, and then a kind of miracle happened. Um, it, it began with the study of these little soil worms called nematodes. And um, scientists realized that these little worms, which are ubiquitous, you can find them any place in the world, have this amazing ability to elongate their lifespans like rubber bands. And the way they do this is early in life, when they're threatened by famine, um, they go into a kind of state of suspended animation where they basically don't age at all. This is called the dour state. And scientists, of course, who study aging got very interested in this in the 1970s. And they began to wonder what kind of little gene machine exists in these, in these animals that enables them to basically take a time out from aging early in life. And so uh, they began to investigate that. And in 1988, a gerontologist, a scientist who studies aging, Tom Johnson at the University of Colorado, actually discovered uh, a single gene mutation in a gene he called age one. That, that could actually double the lifespan of these animals. That was a big surprise. Suddenly, instead of thinking of aging as simply intractable random damage, scientists had to start to rethink. It now appeared that there was actually some genetic rhyme and reason to aging, at least to being able to slow down aging. And so, just five years later, another scientist, Cynthia Kenyon, at the University of California at San Francisco, discovered another such gene called DAF2. And she clarified the picture and added some important news to this developing picture in that she showed that DAF2 is actually one of the genes that helps to turn on this state of suspended animation. And it, it was evolved to turn on this non-aging state early in life while these worms are still larvae. But she showed that it could actually turn it on later in life when they're adults and get very similar anti-aging effects. That was very exciting. The next development was, uh, that, that happened was a few years later, Gary Rufkin, a scientist at Harvard Medical School, showed that this gene, DAF2, has human counterparts. They happen to be two genes for the cellular receptors for two key hormones, insulin and an insulin-like hormone called insulin-like growth factor one. This is very exciting because it suddenly tied these so-called Geronto gene discoveries directly into human biology and kind of raised the possibility that maybe there might be some genes that could slow aging that exist in us, in us higher animals. And interestingly, almost exactly at the same time that Rubkin reported this, this result, scientists at the, at the University of Southern Illinois discovered that mice, that mammals, actually do carry Geronto genes. This discovery was made in these little dwarf mice called Ames dwarves, 
and they, they have a profound pituitary defect that causes them to, to be very short on growth hormone. And as a result, they grow to only about a third of normal size. But what the science at Illinois showed that they, they had long been thought to just be feeble midgets that died young. But, but by some careful, tender, loving care, these Illinois scientists showed that they, they, they actually are very long-lived. In fact, they live 50% longer than normal mice. So, so what this showed, I think all these findings together sort of um, showed uh, that, that there's a really uh, a very big and important uh, development that happened early in the history of life that has to do with aging. And that is that evolution installed a kind of uh, genetic module that can slow aging and enable animals early in life to basically kind of take a time out or at least slow down aging so that if things are stressful, for instance, if there's a shortage of food, they'll live long enough to be able to reproduce. And the really cool thing about this module is that you can turn it on later in life and get profound anti-aging effects. It, and that's why, for instance, I think calorie restriction works in so many species. It's also why this drug rapamycin that I mentioned earlier was able to, to have profound anti-aging effects even when it was given to these mice quite late in their lives. It probably tapped in to this highly evolutionarily conserved, as it's called, genetic module that has the ability to slow aging. So I think it's a very exciting development. And uh, one other reason it's very exciting is it means that uh, we don't have to work out all the monstrously complex uh, molecular damage of aging. We don't have to figure out th all of that. We're sort of in the position of, of drivers who know that if they press on the brake pedal, it will make a car slow down. Uh, they don't understand, or perhaps most of them don't know, anything at all about the complex mechanisms between the brake pedal and the slowing of the wheels. Uh, we're, we're now sort of in a similar position. This genetic module probably has certain sort of high-level control genes that if tweaked just right, might turn on all these complicated downstream effects that we don't fully understand, that do things we also don't fully understand to slow down aging. And I, I think this is a very exciting development. It, it provides a kind of shortcut to finding interventions that might slow aging. And, and I, I call it the great free lunch. I think it would be a very uh, useful thing to be able to turn on. So, so they basically showed that um, in mice that, that if, if we had this, this really profound pituitary defect, that, that we could um, we could switch on or, or rather suppress the, the levels of a number of hormones, including growth hormone, and bring on this anti-aging effect. So that raised the question, okay, do we have to have dwarfing? Do we have to have yeah. growth stunting, some sort of growth stunting process in order to slow aging? And, and this is a, a very interesting question because we see this same phenomenon not only in dwarf mice, but also in dogs. In fact, I, I think you know any good story has a dog in it, so here's the dog in this story. Um, as dog breeders know, very, sh very small dogs like chihuahuas and, and uh, toy poodles are much longer lived than larger breeds like, like uh, Irish wolfhounds and St. Bernard's. In fact, they live about, on average about two or three times longer. I mean, this is very profound. It's, it's as if dog breeders, without knowing it, were actually bioengineering anti-aging genes into these small dog species, which they actually were while, in a, while developing the small breeds. We also see this phenomenon in horses. There are uh, sort of dwarf horse breeds. The, uh, for instance, the Icelandic ponies. They've been known to live close to 60 years of age. Horses of normal size live about 25 to 30 years. So this raises the question, do we see the same phenomenon in people? Maybe pe some people are, are already naturally slow aging because they happen to be dwarves or very small. Um, and and the, the, the data on that are very interesting, but very controversial and mixed. There's not a, a clear-cut picture on that. However, there are some groups of, of, of dwarf, dwarfed people that do seem to be quite extraordinarily long-lived. And I think the most interesting is the case of the munchkins. And I, I mention this because uh, I'm referring, of course, to the Wizard of Oz movie in 1939. Now, I, I did a little research on this, and it turns out that the normal-sized people who played, in the, who were actors in that movie, had all passed away by the mid-1980s. But their, their rough contemporaries, the actors who played the munchkins, were most of them dwarfs, 
And uh, many of them were still alive into the late 1990s and even into the early 2000s. And extraordinarily, some of them even still had agents and were looking for work at that point. My favorite case in point is the Munchkin actor, or the actor who played the Munchkin coroner, who, as you might recall, declared the Wicked Witch really most sincerely dead. <laughs> well, he was really most sincerely alive at age 92 in 2007 when he attended the planting of a, a, a Munchkin star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So uh, he, he passed away, uh, er, actually earlier this year at age 94, uh, and he, according to his obituary, was in very good shape right up to the end, very mentally acute. And that also is an interesting data point, albeit strictly anecdotal, because I think anti-aging interventions are probably likely to compress, in many cases, to compress the period of morbidity toward the end of life. In fact, um, in monkeys on calorie restriction, there's a long ongoing study of monkeys on calorie restriction at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, what we see is, is that um, these monkeys now, which, which are close to their life expectancy of their species, experience only about a third as much age-related disease as, as their normal peers do. So I think it's, and it's possible that toward the end of life we might actually see a compression of morbidity from these things. This calorie restriction, that you detail it quite well in, in your book, but that could be controversial as well, right? It, can you explain what exactly that is? We don't fully understand exactly why uh, calorie restriction uh, tends to ex extend healthy lifespan. But we have some clues. One of the things calorie restriction does is it lowers insulin levels and also lowers blood glucose. And there's, there's a lot of evidence now that low insulin levels go with long, healthy life. I mean, we, we've seen something, I've already mentioned something like this, the, 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 the DAF2 mutation yes. that extends lifespan in, in worms is basically interferes with the insulin system or the ver worm version of the insulin system to extend their lifespans. And also, interestingly, in the longest ongoing study of aging in the country and possibly the world, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, which was started in the 1950s, one of the most interesting data points from that study is that people who tend to live long and well, to be very healthy and have long, healthy lives, have very low insulin levels. They also have very low blood sugar. So I, I sort of want to maybe retroactively preface that and say that in most of us, as we get older, our insulin levels rise. Even, those, even among those of us who are not overweight or headed for diabetes, it's just as if uh, with age, the, the insulin control system gets a little bit sloppy and lets insulin levels drift up along with blood glucose. But in people who are healthy and late in life, uh, the insulin seems to be very tightly controlled and, and remain low. So this, this suggested that maybe part of what's going on with calorie restriction, a, a major part might be have to do with insulin. So that's led to a lot of research on could we mimic the effects of calorie restriction by keeping insulin low. Right. Um, I see. So to manipulate it in that direction yeah. and not put us all on starvation diets. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Right. The, the idea would be to find drugs that could replicate the effects of, of calorie restriction and give us the gain without yes. the pain of relentless hunger, as well as other adverse effects like this, this, this low amount of calories can cause infertility in women and a number of other things right. that people, it makes it simply impossible to use this as an anti-aging intervention for a lot of people. Exactly, so it's an interesting phenomenon, but not one we'd want to try out in a big hurry, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. But you, uh, going back to the various um, things people eat uh, or ingest, the, the kinds of substances that may have an effect on aging as well. The, the, my favorite was caffeine and <laughs> chocolate. I thought this is very wonderful. You mentioned several things. Could you talk about those again for us here? Sure. That gets us into talking about uh, some things you mentioned earlier, like resveratrol. Yes. Um, and, and that the, the whole resveratrol story started about 10 years ago in the lab of MIT's Lenny Garenti. And he and, and colleagues discovered that a, a yeast gene called SIR2 uh, seem to be a kind of a control, controller for calorie restrictions effects in yeast, and that is if, if SIR2 were, were stimulated or amplified, it would, it would actually increase lifespan of, of yeast cells. 
So a few years later, in 2003, one of his former protégés, David Sinclair, now at Harvard Medical School, reported that this famous uh, ingredient of red wine, resveratrol, could stimulate the SIR2 gene and increase lifespan in yeast. And what was especially exciting about this and kind of grabbed people's attention is that uh, resveratrol uh, was also, was already known to have some, some pretty important uh, effects in reducing the risk of various age-related diseases. And also, SIR2, this yeast gene, has a counterpart in mammals, including us, called SIRT1. So it suddenly it, it seemed that perhaps by stimulating SIRT1 with resveratrol, we might get an anti-aging effect akin to that of calorie restriction in mammals and people, so, uh, including people. So um, Sinclair and colleagues pursued this in the following year, in 2004, they showed that resveratrol could also extend lifespan in flies and worms. And shortly after that, an Italian group showed that it could extend lifespan in fish. And then the excitement level really sort of reached fever proportions in, in uh, 2006 when Sinclair and researchers at the National Institute on Aging reported that very high doses of resveratrol in mice on very high fat diets uh, lived longer, that, the, that this, this regimen of chronic doses of resveratrol could seemingly completely block the deleterious effects of the rich diets that these mice were on and extend their lifespans. So that, that was very exciting. It did not prove that resveratrol slows down normal aging. It did show that it may have some important effects of calorie restriction that could be brought into play to help treat uh, diseases related to rich diets and, and being overweight and obese. So um, anyway, just to kind of get to your question here, uh, this resveratrol story uh, continued to develop um, but I think what happened was that, that uh, uh, I, despite this very promising research, no one has really stepped forward to, to uh, turn this into a clinically tested medicines. And I, I, I should hasten to add that resveratrol, despite its promise in 2008, was shown, was, uh, failed to extend lifespan in mice on normal diets. So that didn't necessarily mean that it had failed as a calorie restriction mimetic. It may be that it's a partial calorie restriction mimetic, meaning a drug that partially mimics the effects of calorie restriction. So that's still quite promising, as are the uh, later results that occurred shortly after that, or were reported shortly after that, in rapamycin, this, uh, this other drug I mentioned, that, that very convincingly extends lifespan in animals. But the problem here is that there's the pharmaceutical industry has no incentive to pursue these drugs. Strangely enough, you, you might think they would jump on this, but the problem is that aging is not a disease. It's not considered by the medical establishment to be a condition that, that warrants treatment by FDA-approved prescription drugs. So that leaves us in the position, uh, or the, the drug industry in the position of, of uh, finding no economic incentive to spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing clinical trials of these substances to try to show that they actually do work to mimic calorie restriction uh, because they couldn't then sell them and recoup their costs as high margin, high profit prescription drugs. You simply couldn't recover all those costs by selling them as dietary supplements. So that, that leaves us in a kind of uh, state of, of of being between the research and development stages on this exciting science. We're kind of stuck right there because there's really no great economic incentive for the drug industry to pursue it. And, and you might think also that the National Institute on Aging uh, would look into this, and, and they are to some extent funding it. But, but there too, there, there's not a great deal of interest in trying to push this to the next level. Uh, in which we would clinically test these things. So for me, looking at the, all this developing picture, I think, well, uh, I'm not, being from the show me state, from Missouri, I'm, I'm not really ready to become one of the early adopters and, and start popping resveratrol supplements or, or whatever. So instead, at this point, while I'm waiting for things to happen and there to be some increased funding for this research that would sort of turn it into really uh, clinically proven medicine, I, I've tried to get more 
substances into my diet that, that probably would maybe add a little zing to the, the metabolic pathways that, uh, that seem to be behind the effects of calorie restriction. And so for resveratrol, you know, the, it's, as everyone knows, or, or many people know at this point, a, a glass or two of red wine can give you a little dose of resveratrol, as can chocolate and peanuts. And resveratrol and other resveratrol-like compounds that may have similar effects are also found in things like apples. As for rapamycin, this, this uh, drug uh, is known to inhibit a pathway in mammals called the TOR, T-O-R, which stands for target of rapamycin. Um, and it, interestingly, caffeine appears to also suppress TOR in much the same way that rapamycin does, although perhaps not nearly as potently. So a little, a, a cup of coffee or two, or perhaps some tea might have some effect in suppressing TOR and, and perhaps have some minor, at least, effect in replicating the effects of calorie restriction. I, I would also add that, that, that insulin, which I mentioned earlier, seems to be very closely tied, or keeping insulin levels down, closely tied to healthy, slow aging and to calorie restriction. So there's, a, there's kind of an easy way to, to keep your insulin levels down, and that is to regularly exercise and keep mm -hmm. your weight down. And, th and that can be very important, I think, and, and it's, it wouldn't necessarily extend your lifespan, but it may well extend your health span by turning on some of the same pathways that are turned on by calorie restriction. Right, that's uh, an important point, that it's extending the health span in a, in a lot of ways. That is the goal here. Um, could you give us your best, uh, what, what do you think is the best route uh, that of the emerging possibilities here? Uh, uh, would it be the rapamycin, for example? And I think you mentioned some side effects of things like this. These usually occur. What's your best bet if we could go ahead and develop something to uh, extend life in a healthy way or extend the healthy life? Well, uh, Again, I, I, to, th just as a general strategy, I think what we need to do is take these, these uh, compounds and mechanisms of action that, that have been shown to slow aging in animals and take it into the clinic and test it in people. And this is a, a very expensive and mm -hmm. difficult proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, 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 I'll zero in momentarily on, on, the, on some of the, again, on the compounds that it would be of great interest here. But just as a general strategy, I think we, we need to do that and, and to uh, show about three things. Uh, I would like to see, um, first of all, uh, clinical data that would show that it's safe to take whatever mm -hmm. purported compound is going to slow aging, to, save it, to take, it, take it chronically would be safe. Second, I'd like to know that it actually works as advertised and actually does turn on these anti-aging pathways. That, that may actually slow aging. And thirdly, I'd like to know what dose I'd need to take. And, and that's completely unclear at this point, and that's, that's a, another major issue. And one reason I'm, I haven't joined the early adopters who are popping resveratrol or whatever, I simply don't know what dose it would take uh, to, to really have beneficial effects of interest. So to do this is very difficult because we cannot do what we've done in animals. In animals, you test the effects of an anti-aging drug or, or intervention, whatever, by doing a lifespan study. Basically, you just sit there and wait till the animal or to a group of animals live out their lives and see if they live longer than animals that don't get this treatment. Uh, with humans, we can't do that. It's not. It's just not possible to wait 50 years or 60 years to see if a bunch of people on a particular drug actually live longer. So what we need to do first is develop what are called biomarkers of aging, sort of proxies for aging that would show basically how fast we're going downhill physiologically. So if we had such biomarkers and we could do clinical trials fairly rapidly in years instead of decades and, and show that these things actually have anti-aging effects that would increase health span and give us all the benefits that I was talking about earlier. So at this point, um, given this remarkable result with rapamycin that was shown last year or reported last year in which this drug in three different labs uh, overseen by the National Institute on Aging was able to uh, s dramatically slow aging in these aged mice. I think we have to fixate on rapamycin. Its mode of action perhaps is one of the most promising avenue at this point. Uh, 
not by any means the sole avenue to pursue, but, but, but tour into mission, which is what rapamycin does, is probably at this point the most exciting prospect right now on the anti-aging front. Now rapamycin itself unfortunately has a pretty long list of side effects. They include things like high blood, blood sugar, uh, high blood lipids, it can cause skin rashes, it can in rare cases induce a sort of oddball form of pneumonia, it has other side effects. So these side effects, and also of course has some immune suppressing effects which accounts for its ability to prevent rejection of transplanted organs, which is what it's used for as a medicine. So that probably rules out rapamycin itself as trying it as an anti-aging drug. But I would hasten to add that, that rapamycin has never been tested chronically at low doses in healthy people. The clinical data on rapamycin comes from studies uh, in very sick people who need organ transplants and it's given to them at pretty high doses. So we don't actually quite know what rapamycin would do if we tried to give it to people at low doses. But anyway, my, my hope would be that perhaps uh, going forward, we might see cocktails of drugs that switch on different aspects of, of anti-aging module as it may exist in people. For instance, we might be able to use a TOR inhibitor like rapamycin but with fewer side effects, along with, say, a sir t one stimulator like resveratrol perhaps. And they might actually work synergistically to turn on these anti-aging effects, in which case we could use pretty low doses of each drug in a cocktail to get the desired effects, which would increase the safety factor a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one sort of last question here is that um, you mentioned that the drug industry, which apparently we're going to kind of rely on uh, down the line, then that they have not shown a great deal of interest, which is curious given the potential market in populations that are aging quickly. You would think that they would be very turned on by this, but they're not. Um, could you speculate as to whether you think something might stimulate their interest because apparently this we were going to rely on them ultimately and we'll as a right. last well, question. Well, well they certainly have the big bucks and the means to get drugs to, to a wide population so uh, yeah we're, we're sort of we need in order to realize the promise of this medicine I think we need to commercialize it and have the drug industry play a major role in making it real. Um, that said, as I mentioned earlier, there's really very little economic incentive for the drug industry, oddly enough, to pursue it at this point. So that kind of leaves us in, in the position of we need more government funding to kind of push this forward to a point where the government, where the drug industry would see a, an incentive. And, and for instance, if we could develop biomarkers of aging, that would enable the FDA, for instance, to, to kind of develop a way to, to, to uh, have criteria for testing these medicines for possibly approving them to slow down the rate of aging. So that would be a kind of thing that we would need to do first, but the government would have to fund it. Unfortunately, the NIH, the main body uh, that supports uh, government funded medical research, when it was set up, it, it was organized uh, about 80 years ago and structured around diseases of aging, which was the natural thing to do at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, what it means is that aging, which is not considered a disease, normal right. aging is, is not considered a disease, uh, doesn't fit very well into that framework. And that's one of the problems here. The NIH, the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institute on Health, spends about $5 billion, $5 billion a year on cancer research. Uh, very promising work, but nevertheless directed solely at one disease of aging. The, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute spends another $3 billion a year, largely on cardiovascular uh, diseases. Meanwhile, the National Institute on Aging, which is also part of the NIH, gets about $1 billion a year. And of that, less than $200 million a year goes for you know, research on the basic biology of aging. So in sum, uh, we spend le about 1 25th as much on sort of this, this exciting basic research on aging as we do on researching cancer. And as I mentioned earlier, just a modest increase in life expectancy via these drugs would, would have the equivalent effect on giving us healthy years of 
winning the war on cancer three times over. So th this is kind of, a, to me, a very unfortunate and frustrating situation. And, and I think there are several reasons for it. I mean, one is the way that NIH is structured, but another is that um, this whole area, of course, has long been sort of surrounded by snake oil purveyors, and so there's, there's kind of this worry that this whole area is really uh, dominated by charlatans among those who don't know much about it. And thirdly, there's been so much talk in recent years by kind of visionaries who speculate from their armchairs about how to achieve immortality that I think a lot of people outside of the field look at it and think, oh, it's just completely dominated by kind of wild speculation and extrapolation of what we could do. They're, they're just not familiar with what has actually happened in the lab to, to, to bring this stuff and to make it possible to actually pursue anti-aging interventions in the not distant future that would really work. Well, I hope that your book will contribute to stimulating an interest uh, on the part of the more research and on the development of the pharmaceuticals or whatever it's going to take to uh, improve our last years, our your older age, uh, citizens, citizens um, which are becoming so prevalent in the developing world today that we really have to take uh, uh, make some attention uh, for that. And we have to close now, but I want to thank you very much and recommend highly for the public be, uh, that this is a very fine source of information, very well-rounded and full of many examples of the kind of research that's going on. It's very objective, and uh, it's all in one readable book, a <laughs> very readable book. And David Stipp, I thank you very much for making this visit with us. Thank, thank you, you very much.